Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. And we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished neurosurgeons, Dr. Kojo Hamilton. As for that, Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and again, I want to welcome you all to uh, today's uh, event. Uh, um, it's uh, really a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hamilton, which I'll do in a second, uh, as I uh, commonly uh, do uh, because of uh, my passion with the topic. I talk a little bit about uh, COVID, and my purpose of doing that is to really make sure all of our patients uh, feel uh, safe and, and appropriate to come here. Uh, to the hospitals. Our hospitals are very, very safe. Uh, everybody's wearing a mask. Uh, the vast majority of our uh, clinicians are are vaccinated. Uh, we take extreme uh, cleaning measures to make sure that uh, our hospital is as safe as it can possibly uh, uh, be. And and again, we all come and, and work here without a question uh, or a doubt. I know that there are patients that have uh, uh, delayed their care because of uh, fears of uh, COVID. And again, I would uh, urge anybody that has any issues either to come to the hospital or to call your providers in our Department of Neurosurgery. We're doing quite a bit of uh, telemedicine uh, as well, so you don't even have to come to the hospital and see a lot of our doctors. Actually, one of my favorite ways of, uh, of uh, seeing patients, at least for initial contacts or for, for follow-ups, uh, you know, it's a very, very easy for the patient. You don't have to come into the hospital. You don't have to park, uh, but obviously, if you need to, we're we're always uh, here uh, for you. Uh, I feel uh, that uh, the vaccination process is uh, very, very important. It's what really is going to keep you out of the hospital. And if you do get COVID, uh, you know the symptoms are so much uh, milder. So, uh, you know, I, I want to put in a plug for for the importance of a of a vaccination and those that are uh, still hesitant uh, to do uh, so. Um, I would tell you that you know, obviously I myself as well as my whole family uh, is uh, vaccinated and uh, you should ask your 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 um, primary care physician if you have any questions. Uh, there's uh, more and more data that the vaccines are very, very, very safe as well as effective. Uh, they're effective weans over time and that's why you need a booster. Um, so really important for people to who have not uh, gotten vaccinated uh, to get uh, vaccinated. Now moving into uh, the topic uh, at hand uh, today, uh, really a pleasure to introduce my my good friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Kojo Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is the director of our spine program for throughout uh, UPMC. Dr. Hamilton is an amazing teacher, has uh, won the teaching award from uh, the residents uh, here in our residency, which is uh, really a coveted uh, uh, a distinction for our faculty and one that people compete for. So the, obviously amazing teacher, amazing uh, uh, clinician and uh, in surgeon, which go hand in hand. I send my own uh, relatives uh, to him. Uh, great uh, individual, uh, a lot of on a personal note, a lot of the residents see him as a, as a close friend and, uh, and partner and he's going to uh, give us a talk uh, today. So uh, Dr. Hamilton, thank you very much, very much for joining us and take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Freelander. Those are very nice and uh, 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 very, very uh, <laughs> gracious uh, words. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at Fridays with uh, Freelander Forecast um, and also webcast with the uh, my uh, uh, most uh, favorite uh, topic, uh, a big part of my practice will be uh, the cervical spine, uh, diseases of the cervical spine, and particularly deformity. And today I wanted to give a brief bird's eye view of what really in, uh, 
cervical spine deformity entails. Um, we talk about some of the etiology and a brief discussion of the sur uh, surgical treatment. So what is cervical spine deformity? It, it's, it's a cervical deformity is a kind of disorder influence in the cervical spine alignment in, in, in your, uh, this can cause difficulty in even daily activities such as swallowing, pain, and maintaining an upright position. And what does this look like? This is um, some common causes of this. This could be congenital, i.e. you are born with a primary deformity where you have difficulty raising your head up, um, or degenerative, you have collapse of the intervertebral disc or the vertebra, and also as a result of injury from trauma, I'm going to show a few pictures of that, or if you have an inflammatory condition such as ankylosing spondylitis, or um, have had prior surgery in the neck, um, and now you have a difficulty holding your neck up, or in this current uh, uh, day with a surgeon um, uh, opioid epidemic, we do have uh, a repercussion of that uh, with infections in the cervical spine where uh, it, uh, the uh, substances and clean substances may bring bacteria which can erode the bone, etc. An example of a degenerative um, collapse will be a this uh, very pleasant um, elderly uh, lady who cannot raise her head above um, to look in the horizontal direction. Um, and this will require her to have some uh, surgery to augment her uh, posture. And this causes not just uh, the, her inability to participate in social, but also swallowing. Her neck is tucked in and she has difficulty swallowing. This is the angle in which uh, you could, we call the chin brow angle, where she'll have difficulty with a lot of things. And this causes a lot of stress in the back and shoulders, um, as well as being unsafe when she's walking or moving around. So it is one of the most common deformities uh, in the uh, cervical spine, and it causes what we call a kyphos, uh, kyphosis or kyphoscoliosis. And as I mentioned, it has a global effect. You can see in this column, there's somebody who's an erect normal spine. Um, the head is nicely balanced over the uh, pelvis or the, the, and, and the hip region, and so it takes less force for or, or less pressure off the back. And as they start uh, bending forward, you can see that you are now adding more forces to maintain your alignment and your cone of um, economy. The amount of energy required to keep you upright um, is uh, rather high. And so you cannot stand for too long. And sometimes you can it could lead to uh, you needing to be pitched forward in a hyperlodotic uh, state. And this can result, at, this can come about as a result of surgery. An example would be this gentleman who had surgery in the front of the neck um, for some cervical pinched nerve radiculopathy, as we call it. And they put these graphs in, but subsequently they are now pitched forward and will need some posterior augmentation uh, from this x ray. So, the normal cervical alignment, um, you want the vertebral bodies to be all aligned within one and a half centimeters. Once you start developing cervical deformity in the kyphotic region, um, in, in, of a kyphotic nature, I should say, you start being pitched forward. And anytime your, your neck alignment is pitched forward more than four centimeters, and that doesn't, uh, that equates to, uh, you know, a, a two and a half centimeters an inch. So that equates to an inch and a half less than, uh, certain less than two inches. It doesn't take much for you to start having a significant neck strain. And this could be a normal cervical alignment. Um, you're supporting about 12 pounds of forces from your head, etc., cetera, um, uh, to be balanced. So then as you start pitching forward, you're, you, you start increasing the poundage that it's required uh, to maintain your alignment. So imagine going from 12 pounds to 42 pounds of pressure. It's hard for you to maintain an upright position. It's hard for you to keep your eyes gazing in a horizontal. Um, and that leads to a, a lot of um, uh, pain, misery uh, as well. So mostly we're, all of this is in relation to spinal stability. We're trying to make sure the physiological loads of our own body um, does not damage or irritate the spinal cord that then supply that the nervous system that supplies our muscles 
um, as well. So the more your neck, the bones are deformed, the more it causes spinal cord stretch. And it, over time, it could cause significant uh, muscle deterioration and also uh, significant fatigue and, and, and inability to maintain your uh, activities of daily living. And how is this, uh, how does this come about? It's sometimes you can have the age related disc degeneration. The disc fragments, dehydrates, collapse, and then starts uh, bulging outwards and causes these mechanical stresses. As you can see in the vertebral body, the disc collapses. So then the patient can end up being pitched forward. So part of the disc collapse can cause these static mechanical factors and dynamic mechanical factors as well as the pinching of the spinal cord could cause it to have ischemia or even stroke, i.e. The, the blood supply to the spinal uh, cord becomes compromised because of the uh, pinching. And that could also lead to even a semblance of spinal cord uh, injury uh, over, over a chronic period of time. And some of these static mechanical, uh, as I mentioned, is just a slow narrowing from the disc collapse, normal disc here, and as it pinches, the white spinal cord starts getting compressed, which sometimes could lead to the ischemia. As I mentioned, the larger vessels um, start getting cut off from the, the disc compression, and it could cause uh, what we call demyelination or sloughing off of the spinal cord uh, 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 covering and, and also nerves, which over time could lead to a lot of disability. So how do we evaluate this? There are some certain signs and symptoms, i.e. gait abnormalities. People walk with a wide base gait. They are, they've lost their ability to feel with their upper extremities, significant neck stiffness, and also loss of manual dexterity. And it could be very profound with also atrophy of the hands, as we can see here, um, and, 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 and also in the, uh, around the little finger and also around the thumb area. Because if you look over in your thumb, you can see it should be in the absence of disease or, or muscle wasting uh, as a result of compressed nerves not being innervated. You end up seeing areas uh, here where it's not a thick uh, and filled with tissue, but it's also very hollow. And that in conjunction with poor dexterity all war and gait uh, issues are all warning signs of, of uh, cord compression. So, Cervical deformity tends to perpetuate itself. It's not static. Once you start the process, over time, you get to be more forward shifting. There's more cord compression. And as I mentioned, the uh, myriad of, uh, of, of uh, incapacitating symptoms, such as myelopathy, cord loss of horizontal gaze, difficulty swallowing, and most debilitating is the, is the pain associated with that. And here you can see an MRI of a patient who uh, progressed over time. They did have some subtle bulges here, but over time they progressed to complete collapse of the disc. We can see the MRI uh, T2 signal of the vertebral bodies now stacked on each other. There's no disc space and their spinal cord the bulges uh, towards the spinal cord and it's now become very compressed and thin. Sometimes you can get it from a traumatic uh, issue from a either motor vehicle accident or even a sudden fall where you get the compression and the deformity because you've lost your ability to maintain the ligament structure because it gets significantly disrupted. We know it when we see it, this requires immediate attention, i.e. this patient that was in a horrific motor vehicle accident and shattered the vertebral uh, body at this level, which then immediately put pressure on the spinal cord. They could end up uh, losing immediate function. So this requires, this is a more um, dramatic example of an immediate attention that's required to restore the uh, cervical alignment because of the spinal cord injury um, involved, which could be uh, permanent um, if, if the forces are strong enough. But more than with, with advances lately, um, uh, uh, mostly with research here also done on the spinal cord injury at UPMC, we're, we're always eager to quickly address this um, to provide any opportunity for spinal cord healing. Sometimes you end up having a either tumor or, 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 or spine surgery, um, which then requires you to have the posterior tension bond. It's what we refer to as the ligaments and bony structure in the posterior part of the spine being removed. 
um, and that could also cause issues of, uh, uh, of uh, loss of the uh, alignment. We also could have issues of a portion of the spinal uh, canal being uh, or the spinal column being fused and this could then create long liver arms um, or should I say uh, a large ful fulcrum that swings the patient's head forward and also pre-existing bad posture uh, could also lead to further muscle degenerative and wasting. So a loss of the tension band would be this patient who as a teenager had uh, a spinal cord a tumor that was removed um, by uh, at that time, the best would be to take the bones of the back of the spine and ad address this tumor. Over time, they've now lost the ability to hold their head up and it's adding more stretch. So they felt like they were having the symptoms of their tumor come back, but this really was a stretch of the spinal cord. In this column D, you can see the spinal cord being stretched over and in column F, you can see the bony uh, stretch uh, as we can uh, appreciate. So this requires us to do a lot of um, uh, reconstruction of the spinal canal to allow the spinal cord to be less stretched. Sometimes you can have a portion of your spine fused for degenerative process, but that causes a more burden of, uh, mus uh, of uh, weight over your spine, which leads it to be pitched forward and and um, it could also uh, cause you to not be able to maintain your alignment as well. A lot of my um, uh, practice involves uh, re spinal reconstruction and I, I tend to see this a lot. And you can also have what we call fault lines where you've had uh, piecemeal, you have one portion of your neck done in the front and then they went back to do another portion. So you create this fault line where it seems like your whole muscles are trying to maintain all these uh, piecemeal work being done to address individual problems in your cervical spine, but it leads to a global problem of you not being able to hold your neck up. Unfortunately, this patient, when they presented to me, they had stimulators placed that had drifted out um, in, into the muscle tissue uh, to try to uh, alleviate their pain, but this was a structural problem uh, causing their pain. So we also have in, in our region, a, pay, a poor patient profile, i.e. somebody with advanced hypertension with renal disease, they are not making good bone or they are aged and they, they have a, a, a osteopenia osteoporosis. So they tend to have a settling of their bone structure um, and we have to consider placing specialized implants um, to make sure that it matches their the uh, uh, bone structure. Um, the example would be this gentleman that I showed you earlier. He had uh, metal implants placed in between his vertebral bodies, but the, 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 they all collapsed because he had poor um, renal function. And so he had to be augmented and uh, with extra support in the back to help him maintain his horizontal gaze. An example would be this lady that I showed you earlier when she presented, she couldn't look up and now with augmentation um, with uh, rods and screws and also making fine cuts around her nerves in the bone, we're able to hold her head up and she has a better quality of life and uh, resolution of the pain. So it, this is a more of a bedside view, but really what we're trying to do is what uh, Dr. Dubousset in France always mentioned uh, several decades ago, is to try to help you maintain a cone of uh, economy around your, your posture. Uh, if you pitch forward, you're expending more energy to maintain an upright position. If you pitch backwards, similarly, and it, the best way is to be in a little cone where you're using less, as little energy as possible uh, to maintain an upright position. And so in conclusion, we always talk about um, the significant concerns, the understanding of the global spine, in, and also uh, we like to rehab our, or sort of prehab our patients who present with osteoporosis with um, uh, disease modifying agents, uh, endocrine referral, um, smoking sensation. And we also discuss possibility of secondary surgeries based on uh, the presentation. We have a very specialized, individualized 
um, uh, practice based on what each patient presents with. We do have a very uh, wonderful relationship with both our musculoskeletal clinic, our prehab unit, um, and also uh, endocrinologist. And uh, sometimes I will spend at least a year getting somebody ready for reconstruction due to their bone uh, fragility. And certainly uh, the effects of smoking uh, and uh, particular nicotine in, in displacing oxygen from bones, uh, making them weaker and also having poor wound healing uh, makes it a big factor to be considered prior to any reconstructive uh, spine surgery due to cervical deformity or otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamilton. What an incredible presentation. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, we'll try to get, answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Would you like to start us off? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Kojo, really great uh, presentation. I have a uh, twofold uh, question. Uh, one is throughout your training and career, how have you, you changed in the way that you approach these patients and uh, manage the patients? And then second related, how has in that period of time, how has the technology um, change uh, in terms of I know that there are you know different types of instruments, different materials, but also the science has advanced uh, in, in our understanding. So if you could address those two, I would appreciate it. That's a uh, those are two great questions. Um, I, I would say that the um, I'll answer the 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 the, the second one um, first. Um, the technology and also the science behind our understanding of this uh, pathology, cervical deformity, and spine in general is uh, leaps uh, ahead of uh, when when I started. Um, we do now have the capacity to augment and stabilize the spine in, in a way in which we never had with very, uh, very less uh, detriment, sort of blood loss and also rehab. And it's really because the, the field has, has now evolved to a, a place where there's more collaboration. And within the UPMC system, it's much easier because everybody belongs to the same uh, family. So it's easy to, uh, uh, to afford that collaboration. Um, it used to be you had your spine surgeon treat you and that was the end of it. But now it's sort of even before the patients uh, get here, you have uh, several opportunities for either the musculoskeletal clinic, the uh, physical therapist uh, to try all these modalities that um, for our deformity, we never even uh, had that space. It just felt like you at the end of your physical therapy you, you, and you couldn't hold your head up, that was the end for you. We now know that certain diseases also can um, present in this fashion that we sometimes will treat without even doing any surgery. Sort of like rheumatologic diseases that we used to end up having um, surgery with uh, uh, with uh, really uh, painful surgeries, uh, sort of spine reconstructive surgeries. Um, it's now only at the end stages where we'll end up, if somebody say develops a significant compression of the spinal cord, either being a rheumatoid panis, um, because they're not responsive to medications to, to reduce that uh, uh, panis or even re prevent it from happening, is that we collaborate sometimes even with uh, our skull base uh, colleagues where they, without, um, with, without any incision, they're able to go through the nasal and our oral uh, uh, passages to resect any compression in the skull base. And then I just end up doing a very minimal incision in the back of the neck to take off this pressure of the uh, of the spinal cord and and support it after they've taken the pressure of the spinal cord and also with the instrumentation navigation navigated instrumentation it's made the surgery much much safer than it used to be and all these are afforded due to a significant collaboration um, here at UPMC the biggest my referrals are both neurologists uh, rheumatoid doctors and endo so endocrinologists, as well as uh, primary care doctors and physical medicine um, colleagues. This then has led to, in answering your second, uh, uh, should I say your first question, 
uh, has led to an evolution of my practice uh, to say that the surgeon is, is not the, um, it may be the captain of your surgical disease, but um, it's, a, it's a ship that's run with a lot of departments um, and, and it takes a lot of collaborative effort. And I would say that after my training, it seemed like you had to take care of the patient, um, not just the surgical part, but you you had to. We didn't have a whole lot, you know, a whole lot of, um, I would say, options for people with uh, significant disease. That as the surgeon, once you had your surgery done and they were out of the post-operative period, uh, it seems like they they were the patient was uh, left on your own. Now it's a long uh, process where there's support um, before even the surgery uh, with a prehab with a phys physiatrist. Uh, physical therapist, occupational therapist, in preparation for the surgery, going through our um, centers for perioperative care uh, to identify issues that could um, that could cause uh, worsening or, or should I say complications or make them not suitable for immediate surgery, making adjustments to that, to after the surgery, the aftercare, which is a big deal for me, including you know not just home health, um, but also uh, uh, therapy again, and it all helps um, manage expectations and also prepare you for a rather uh, a, um, uh, invasive and or sometimes even frightful uh, procedure to know that you're going to be taken care of and there are uh, several um, opportunities for you to um, get the optimal care. So my practice I involved in having all this in place even before uh, the surgery is even discussed. Um, and it's really helped in terms of optimizing not just the patient's experience, but also the uh, care at the end. So with this collaboration and particularly in a, in a network as we have at UPMC, it's made it uh, rather uh, easier for me to get the team together. So it's helped my practice a lot and it's evolved in that direction and my patients um, outcomes are much, much better as a result of that. You know, if you go see five spine surgeons, you're going to have five different opinions, uh, and not and and that's not particular to to spine, but it's a it's a it's common in medicine. It's just it's a matter, uh, it's an art. It's not a science. Uh, so different people are going to have different uh, opinions, and you know sometimes you could say some opinions are better uh, than others, or better suited uh, for the patient, but. How's uh, you know AI and machine learning um, uh, interfacing now with uh, with a uh, spine surgery? It's one that it, um, it's part of. First things first. In order for the machine to have the data, it has to be inputted a data to help uh, extrapolate it with machine learning. And over here at the uh, uh, UPMC, uh, in collaboration with with other uh, institutions, particularly my work uh, um, in other uh, uh, spine study group, we're able to, uh, with our individual practice, we always collect patient uh, reported outcomes, and that helps to identify um, with, you know, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, let's say which outcomes are the most optimal for the exact patient, and and it. it it does help um, uh, give an opportunity for the um, for the uh, practitioner to say, with your exact presentation, based on thousands of collected information and an extrapolation of your current um, disorder, and looking down the line, you benefit from this procedure versus the other procedure, and we're doing that more and more. And sometimes it's helpful when the patients share the experience. All my patients have to anonymously share the experience. I'm, I'm sometimes not even, uh, sometimes uh, unless they, they request it, uh, I don't even know the results of the, the outcomes. I go into the room, I'd say, how are you doing? They, they, they are quite happy, uh, but I never get to, um, I never get to have the, uh, uh, all the answers because it's all fed into the computer. We have research coordinators that could 
literally say, this is how your patient did. Um, but it's really helpful and it's the way is the future is the way is the way the future is going to be honest yeah no great great information and obviously you know the, the data on the on the on the back end is is only as good as the data on the front end and, and the veracity uh, of the data and i know that our our spine team here is is amazing and really uh setting the path uh for the spine specialty in in publications but really uh, cataloging all the procedures and the pre-op conditions and, and outcomes, and that's that's so so important in what we do. Uh, as you know, next week we're going to uh, start our interview process for for residents, and you're very very involved in the in this process uh, all together. Uh, and for the uh, listeners, uh, you know, our residency program is uh, is uh, as all others are, are seven years in length. Uh, we trained four residents a, a year, making us the largest department of uh, neurosurgery uh, in the country from a training point of view. So a lot of uh, uh, pleasure and responsibility in in doing that. Um, we're going to be interviewing uh, 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 medical students uh, next week. Uh, we've got about 400 applications uh, for four spots. So obviously a very, very competitive uh, process. But Dr. Hamilton, uh, you being such an amazing teacher, tell us your approach to teaching spine surgery to residents? How do we how do we do that? That's a great question, Dr. Prelander. Um, the the real uh, issue is is prior to they um, coming, they've gone through the process of identifying that they do want to become neurological surgeons, a predominant uh, subspecialty neurological surgery, spine surgery. Um, the first instances um, getting their fund of knowledge um, up to speed. Uh, they come from different uh, medical schools and really we have a robust curriculum including conferences, uh, including um, uh, research and also didactic training as well as first a graduated exposure uh, in the operating room. We start from the basics, positioning, and then observation for several years to months. Um, but initially, we quickly start by exposing them to um, the uh, practical aspects of what they've read, um, uh, pointing out uh, anatomy, um, explaining exactly what we're planning on doing. They're involved as they rotate through several spine faculty, uh, the nuances of uh, different uh, operative uh, management and non-operative management as they rotate through clinic. So they slowly um, get to the point where they become uh, independent um, at the end of their uh, uh, training. And this is uh, from my training program experiences. We never um, experiment uh, on, on patients. Um, we only train uh, residents. So this is with them across the table across all the time and because they spend a significant amount of time in each rotation we're able to assess their comfort levels we're able to assess their capacity um, for uh, exposing them and also graduating them to a uh, higher level of of, um, of responsibility and, and skill and at the uh, at least uh, biannually, um, all faculty in the uh, uh, core curriculum we meet and we go through a period of uh, three hours each uh, uh, resident. And part of, of that evaluation is um, the uh, skill level, comfort level, how we feel about about them. So there's always a multitude of uh, evaluating, uh, preparing uh, uh, all these. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, residents uh, for independent and future practice um, that provides a, a more of a 360 evaluation and and also a, a subtle one-on-one -on -one evaluation and training and of course they also are subjected to uh, a rigorous uh, uh, mock and also uh, national uh, boards that they, they take as part of their graduating process yeah Thank you very much uh, with that uh, uh, thorough explanation. I know that uh, both uh, 
you and I, as well as really the whole faculty, are incredibly passionate and uh, see it as a as a tremendous responsibility in the training process because these are the neurosurgeons that are going to be out there, the neurosurgeons for the future. Obviously, being that we're a leading department of neurosurgery, we're looking to train the future academic uh, leaders of neurosurgery, which are going to be the people that will change neurosurgery uh, moving forward. So we're very proud of our uh, field and uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, uh, Justin, uh, do you have any other questions uh, from the audience? We do. We have a number of questions, Dr. Freelander. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, first question here for you. Can you tell me a little bit about Pitt's research on the C1 vertebrae? Please also tell me about any new procedures or treatments that are being developed. Ah, uh, good. Um, that's uh, a, a that's a really good question. The C1 vertebrae in particular is this is the first uh, vertebrae, as we mentioned, C1 in the cervical spine. Um, it's uh, docks at the base of your skull, and um, it, it provides the uh, uh, you know an ability for your skull to rock on the top of your cervical spine. It most often um, will be sort of the the collarbone of the cervical spine um, in, and it tends to fracture outwards or it tends to be involved in in say rheumatoid disease we're looking at um, a multitude of things uh, uh, with the uh, cervical spine and in sort of the upper cervical spine which the c1 is involved in we're trying to see um, two things uh, tumor invasion at, at the joints, um, the laxicity that we may have uh, from, say, a, uh, uh, a, a fracture um, in that region. And we've looked at several things, sort of uh, how many ligaments can be destroyed before it loses competency, um, whether we need MRIs to, to evaluate competency, if we should see uh, a displacement or a fracture. and these days we're also collecting after surgery um, particularly with my skull based colleagues um, the integrity of the uh, instrumentation that's been placed there um, uh, as well so i can count on at least five uh, different research processes and the last being one of my favorite is really the patient reported outcomes for upper cervical fusion that we're collecting with at least 11 other centers um, to to further um, elucidate the actual uh, effect of say instrumentation, not instrumenting, instrumenting, and also um, the effect on the patient's range of motion after uh, any surgery or not, uh, no surgery at that level. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, comment and a question here. Outstanding presentation. Are, is there an age limit for this surgery and what kind of nutritional support do you recommend beforehand? That's a really great question. Uh, I would say that the level of um, the level of deformity and the patient's presentation may uh, uh, much more important than age. Uh, if say somebody presents very poorly uh, um, malnourished or have a poor, low protein um, count which always uh, tends to be part of our wound healing uh, issue uh, we do have them have a strict nutrition assessment which include several labs including their pre-albumin albumin and also inflammatory markers we're getting a lot of studies out about the uh, ratio of, say, albumin to uh, inflammatory marker CRP in terms of a frailty. We call it metabolic frailty. Um, and that is attributed to wound healing, et cetera. So we always want to make sure that you're uh, fine tuned to that. And that's part of our general labs when you come for consultation. And I would say uh, the uh, after operating on uh, this past uh, I would say this past uh, spring um, on a, uh, a 99 year old uh, who uh, worked on a, actively worked on a farm after serving in the uh, Second World War in France and, um, and, and Europe. Uh, I would say that my, uh, he's the second oldest I've operated on his cervical spine. 
uh, for spy deformity, uh, I would say the, the oldest would be 102. So at this point, I'm not sure if I can say age as opposed to their frailty, as opposed to how well we can get their frailty to a safe um, uh, level before operating, uh, operating on them matters more. That's outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, two comments um, here. Uh, one, Dr. Hamilton is a wonderful and caring physician. Uh, second comment here, I'm a former patient of yours. And I am so grateful for your care. Congratulations on your distinction as professor in the department. So congr congratulations, Dr. Hamilton. Oh, dear. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. How often are patients uh, who are looking for surgical treatment actually would be better served by physical therapy or, or other treatments? That's a good question also. Uh, I, I really like these questions. Um, the, the real thing is the incidence of, of the need for surgery is rather low. Um, it may seem that on my presentation, but it's rather low. And as I'm, I've mentioned several times, during the presentation and during the Q&A, the collaborative effort that I have um, at least removes uh, at least 60% 60, 60 of the patients that have not had any exposure to me. I always prefer to see somebody who has had um, bearing a rather uh, dangerously or precarious uh, presentation with any pathology, i.e. they've got cord compression. If they've got significant um, mostly musculoskeletal issues um, or even joint issues without cord compression. I want them to max out on uh, physical therapy um, to see if this is all that, uh, that's all that they need. And I've had patients that after um, they self-report a significant improvement in their function, and I say function is determinant on what they want to do with their lives. So somebody who day-to-day uh, -day, uh, does a lot of um, uh, chair work, um, goes around uh, uh, to the grocery store, etc. A, a, a robust physical therapy and not just stopping after you've done your six weeks, my, uh, six weeks a lot of time, but actually engage in check-ins with a physical therapist, actually uh, start doing the exercise on your own and increase in your activity, they, they tend to not even need, in the absence of direct spinal cord compression or a complete musculoskeletal skeletal failure, they tend to rehab quite well. It's more of how long do you want to go, go on and how well do you think um, you're responding to physical therapy? And, and I'm always keen on getting people away from surgery um, if I can help it. And it's, it's, it's only those that I know um, physical therapy may contribute to more harm after looking at imaging, their exam, uh, if they have myelopathy, as I mentioned, i.e. compression of the spinal cord nerves to a degree where we can see changes um, is, is where I, I advocate for surgery. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, question sort of, I guess, along the same lines. What do you think about patients delaying surgery being more prone to overusing pain medication to cope with their spinal pain? The, it, that has been a, uh, an issue. So in pain medications, I over-the-counter versus prescribed, I always warn patients about not just the, say, with uh, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications to be on the lookout for the consequence of that, um, i.e. if there's going to be liver or renal dysfunction to say, um, I would prefer that you're also uh, alerting your primary care provider um, so they can draw basic labs to make sure you're not causing further metabolic damage. When it comes to narcotics, I, I think uh, the the uh, education is, is out. Um, I would tell patients that uh, there is a strong dependency link to it. And my goal is to, is to not get them to that point. 
there are a few exceptions, people who are so frail, and it's never those so frail that surgery is a non-starter, who may need a very, very, very supervised low dose narcotic um, to be able to get some independence. Now, I say that with a lot of caution because um, I can count after uh, over a decade of practice, I can count on, on, on one hand the number of patients that I've seen that needed that. And, and we're talking uh, patients who are uh, have severe metastatic uh, disease um, and surprisingly, they're the least um, interested in narcotic medication, but I, um, who are so frail and are almost almost terminal that need uh, narcotics uh, to to just get some independence and dignity at the end of the life. Um, but uh, for an average uh, adult, um, I would say that uh, in, in the absence of, of all these extreme uh, scenarios. Um, we do abstain from narcotics. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, let's see, we have time for one last question here. I think it's a good one to end on. Um, what is the most exciting thing about pra having your practice within UPMC and Pitt? I think it's very, that's a very easy answer. Uh, the active collaborative environment, the uh, you know, avant-garde and I'll say cutting edge uh, uh, devotion to research, um, leading us to be exposed to things that are new. The fact that being in Pittsburgh itself uh, with our uh, uh, world-renowned colleges, the collaboration amongst, um, you know, like-minded uh, scientists in, in, in not just in the University of Pitt, but in CMU, um, and also uh, our closeness to the uh, NIH, we're well positioned to be a center for any cutting edge uh, um, breakthroughs. Uh, and, and it makes it more, it, it makes it uh, more comforting when you're here to, to, to be uh, and practice and to, to know that um, you will be considered for any breakthroughs. And that leads you to, as a physician to be um, I would say uh, elated uh, to, to, the, to the point that you know that what you're presenting and providing your patients um, is has been vetted by the best authorities and the best minds, and you're participating as uh, as one of uh, the uh, as one of the uh, as one of the I would say not just scientists but also uh, physicians. So that makes it exciting for me to be here. Um, uh, we're just surrounded by richness of, of scientific thought and the, uh, my colleagues um, makes it easy for me to, to, to provide the best care that I can. And the UPMC brand is sort of set up to, to foster this collegiality. That's great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton. Again, incredible presentation. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. Again, if you have any questions or would like to learn about ways to support the work that you just heard about, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. We're so happy to be able to stay connected with our Department of Neurosurgery friends this way. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to uh, close this out for the day, please? Well, thank you very much, and uh, Dr. Hamilton, really fantastic. You embody so many of the uh, best of the best uh, qualities that uh, make me so proud of uh, this uh, department. Uh, integrity, uh, really dedication to the to your patients and to our residents, and just uh, fantastic uh, clinicians. One of the things from our clinicians in our department is that we're so specialized, subspecialized, and being such a large department that. The volume that we see is is tremendous, but not only the volume, the complexity. So many patients from the, our region and the country, as well as international, come and seeking our experts. That uh, our experts get very, very good at treating uh, both the simple problems, if there is such a thing as a simple problem, but also the very, very complex. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamilton, uh, for sharing uh, your wisdom uh, with us. Uh, I'd like to wish. Uh, all of our listeners, uh, very happy and healthy uh, Thanksgiving. Hopefully you're all together with your uh, families and enjoying this uh, this important uh, 
time uh, uh, together and we'll be taking a break uh, for the Thanksgiving uh, break and uh, we will be seeing you uh, in a couple of weeks. So again, thank you very much and have a great weekend.